Good evening and welcome to UT Southwestern Science Cafe. My name is Leslie Pomeroy and I'm from the marketing team at UT Southwestern Simmons Cancer Center. On behalf of my colleagues and our hosts, the public affairs team, as well as our guest speaker, Dr. Divya Srivastava, thank you for joining us tonight. Science cafes are online conversations where our speakers take you on deep dives into the science of healthcare. As an academic medical center, UT Southwestern brings research, health education, and patient care into one institution. This evening, our topic is Skin Savvy, Understanding Skin Cancer with Dr. Divya Srivastava. More on her in just a moment. But before we begin, let me share a few technical points. We are recording this program and live streaming it on our UT Southwestern Twitter page. Please mute your microphones to help with audio clarity for everyone. We encourage you to leave your camera on so we can see each other, especially during the Q&A portion of the program. Finally, just a reminder, while we cannot answer personal medical questions, we would love to hear from you with any questions you may have in the chat. And with that, I am pleased to introduce our guest speaker. Dr. Divya Srivastava is an Associate Professor of Dermatology Director of Mohs Surgery and Director of Dermatologic Oncology at UT Southwestern. She specializes in Mohs Surgery, a meticulous technique that provides the highest cure rate for most skin cancers. Dr. Srivastava, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Welcome to Science Cafe. The virtual podium is all yours. Thank you so much, Leslie, for that um, introduction. And thank you everyone for joining us to discuss this really important topic, you know, especially as we're entering the summer season right now, um, where everyone is getting a lot of sun exposure and um, is concerned about protecting themselves. So hopefully in the next 45 minutes or so, we'll go through um, some details about what to look for for skin cancer and how to prevent skin cancer and what the best treatment options are for skin cancer. So I'm gonna ask some questions first to um, make this a little fun. So how many Americans develop skin cancer every year? Is it one in two, one in five, one in 10, or one in 20? So it looks like the majority of people said one in five, just under half of the group said one in five, which is the correct answer. And we will go to the next question. Which of the following are risk factors for skin cancer development? Tanning bed use, ultraviolet radiation, human papillomavirus, fair skin, or all of the above? And this one was a gimme, this is all of the above. And you guys are already ahead of the game kind of understanding some of these um, risk factors. And we'll go to the last question. What SPF level protects you from 97% of the sun's rays? And this one is split uh, two thirds SPF 30, about a third SPF 100. And the correct answer is SPF 30. And we'll talk about what SPF means and what's the best SPF to protect yourself. All right, so here are the straight up facts. One in five people will develop skin cancer by the age of 70. More than 9,500 people are diagnosed with skin cancer every day. And more than two people die of skin cancer in America every hour. It's the most common cancer worldwide and more people are diagnosed with skin cancer than all other cancers combined. But the upside is, is that it's the most preventable cancer. It's highly treatable with excellent outcomes when detected early. 
the five-year survival rate for melanoma that's detected and treated before lymph node spread is 99%, which is really excellent. And there's new innovations and treatments for metastatic melanoma and metastatic squamous cell carcinoma, which have really improved the longevity of our patients with advanced disease. So what can we do? We can recognize the risk factors. We can employ methods for surveillance and early detection. We can understand the best treatment options for your cancer, and we can implement science-based preventive strategies. So what is skin cancer? It's the abnormal growth of skin cells caused by ultraviolet radiation. And the most common cancers that we're gonna really focus on during this session are basal cell carcinoma, squamous cell carcinoma, and melanoma. So skin cancer forms when ultraviolet radiation damages DNA, creates mutations in our DNA, and that alters genes that are called oncogenes or tumor suppressor genes. And these are genes that are involved in cell growth and proliferation. And when these are damaged, you get uncontrolled proliferation of either keratinocytes in basal cell and squamous cell carcinoma or melanocytes in melanoma. And this leads to skin cancer formation. So what are some of the risk factors? You guys you know, nailed that question earlier. So we know this a little bit about this already but ultraviolet radiation and indoor tanning devices are really you know, top of the list for skin cancer risk factors. And um, 75 there's a 75% increased risk of developing life-threatening melanoma from just one indoor tanning session before the age of 35. So that's just one session. Skin type is important. P patients with fair skin or red blonde hair are at higher risk. Patients with a history of sunburns are at higher risk. And in fact, your risk of developing potentially deadly melanoma doubles with a history of five or more sunburns, or one blistering sunburn can even increase your risk of melanoma. Patients who have a personal or family history of skin cancer are at risk, and patients who have a history of melanoma are already at an eight time higher increased risk of getting a second melanoma. Patients who have a weak immune system, this means maybe they've had an organ transplant and they're on immunosuppressive medications, or they have a history of lymphoma or leukemia, or they're on um, immunosuppressive medications for things like rheumatoid arthritis or psoriasis or inflammatory bowel disorder. Um, patients who have more than 50 moles or atypical moles or large moles are at risk. Um, patients who have exposure to human papillomavirus are at risk, especially for um, oral skin cancers, genital skin cancers, and nail skin cancers and patients with um, genetic syndromes are at risk. And people with 10 or more atypical moles have a 12 times increased risk of melanoma if you have many of these atypical moles. So what is the deal with ultraviolet radiation? The rays that we're really concerned with are UVA and UVB. And UVA can, makes up the majority of the rays that reach the skin, the earth's surface. And these lead to skin cancer and aging. And UVA rays do pass through window glass. So your windows at home, your windows in your car, UVA does pass that. Now, most windshields are protected against UVA, but usually the side windows and sunroofs are not. UVB rays, this is um, a shorter wavelength, and this leads to skin cancer and sunburn. UVB rays are blocked by window glass. Now the entire UV spectrum is classified as carcinogenic by the International Agency on Cancer Research and the World Health Organization classified tanning beds in the highest cancer risk category comparable to cigarettes and plutonium. And the FDA recently reclassified tanning beds as a moderate to high risk device. And tanning devices emit um, ultraviolet radiation 10 to 15 times higher than the sun at its peak intensity. And most people get skin cancer from indoor tanning. More people get skin cancer from indoor tanning than develop lung cancer from smoking. And that statistic always shocks me because tanning is almost glamorized. You know, this is a shot from the Jersey Shore show where everyone is talking about, you know, spending their day going to the gym, going to the tanning salon, doing their laundry like it was just another errand to run. Um, but we know that women younger than 30 are six times more likely to develop melanoma if they tan indoor. There was one study of 63 women who, who had melanoma under the age of 30, and almost all of them had tanned indoors. Um, and it also increases your risk of squamous cell and basal cell carcinoma. So now 19 states actually prohibit tanning under the age of 18. You know, in the last decade, there's been legislation, including in Texas, where we're prohibiting tanning under the age of 18, whereas before, you know, you could be 12, 13, 14 and go to the tanning salon and potentially be making decisions um, for your health that were not optimal. Um, Brazil and Australia have completely banned indoor tanning. And part of the reason is there's so much money that goes into spending, medical um, spending for tanning related healthcare. And this includes things like going to the emergency room for sunburns, skin cancer treatment and cataracts. But despite banning the tan, um, 8 million people still tan in America. 
Um, luckily, this is trending down in the teenage group. Half of tanners start before the age of 21, and half of those patients who start before the age of 16 start with a family member, often um, with their mom. So some questions that patients always ask me um, when they're seeing me in the clinic is, isn't it protective to get a base tan before going on my beach vacation? Won't this protect me from a sunburn? And the answer is really no. Tanning does not prevent against sunburn. It, it really won't protect you. It just increases your cumulative dose of ultraviolet radiation. Patients ask, does tanning help with seasonal affective disorder? Now, tanning definitely has been shown to have, you know, addictive behavior, uh, addictive qualities to it, and it does make you feel better. Um, but it, studies have shown that it doesn't actually improve seasonal affective disorder. Um, is tanning a good way to get my vitamin D? And the answer there is also no. And there's been studies that show that even um, tanning outside or indoor tanning doesn't actually um, lead to increased vitamin D levels and you still need to supplement orally. And we'll talk a little bit more about this later as well. And what about self tanners? So there's a chemical called dihy dihydroxyacetone, DHA, and when applied to the skin, there's a chemical reaction with the amino acids or proteins in the surface of the skin, that stratum corneum, which is the most surface of the skin, and that leads to a darkening effect. And this is FDA approved. And I say, if you want that tanning effect, at this point, this is probably the safest way to get it. Um, and while it's FDA approved, there's always you know, safety studies ongoing. Now, while fair skin and fair, you know, hair and eyes are, you know, high, put you at high risk for skin cancer, skin cancer is still seen in patients with skin of color who have darker skin types. It tends to occur in non-sun exposed skin sites, including palms, soles, mucosa, and genital areas. It tends to be diagnosed at advanced stages, often because patients don't think they're at risk for skin cancers. And so they're not going in for screenings and protecting themselves. And um, the five-year survival for melanoma in black patients is 71% versus 93% in white patients. And this is because of that delayed diagnosis. Um, patients who are immunosuppressed, which I mentioned earlier, especially the organ transplant recipients are at much higher risk of developing aggressive skin cancers and just skin cancers in general. And with squamous cell carcinoma, it's almost a 200 times increased risk of developing those cancers. And then I also mentioned the leukemia lymphoma patients and patients who are on other immunosuppressive medications. So what should we be looking for? I'm gonna show you a lot of pictures of you know, what we can look for for skin cancers. So basal cell carcinoma is the most common cancer worldwide. Typically it stays limited to the skin. It typically doesn't travel inside the body to things like lymph nodes or organs, but we wanna treat it because it's gonna to continue to grow in the skin. It can go even grow through your fat and muscle and down into the bone. So it spreads by sort of local infiltration and destruction. It can damage critical structures like your nerve or muscle, and it can lead to disfigurement. So we wanna catch these early and treat these early. And we can get excellent cure rates of 99% with treating basal cells. Um, and patients who have one basal cell are at about a 40% chance of developing another one. So where are we looking? Sun exposed areas, the head and neck, the hands and arms. And signs are for basal cells include having like a small pearly translucent bump, like a shiny bump. Sometimes patients say they have a pimple that doesn't go away. Um, there's a form that can look like a thick scar, piece of scar tissue. And patients will say that, you know, I have this scar here, but I don't remember ever having a procedure or injury in the area. And it's almost like a shiny scar. You can have a red scaly patch. And sometimes this just looks like eczema. And um, that can be a superficial basal cell. And usually a common sign or symptom is a bleeding or crusting spot that doesn't quite go away. Now, squamous cell carcinoma is the second most common cancer. Um, this can occur in head and neck sites as well, but it can also occur in scars, especially burn scars, wound, chronic wounds, radiation sites. And um, I mentioned earlier that patients with uh, transplants and leukemia or lymphoma are at higher risk. And squamous cells can infiltrate and destroy local tissue, and it can spread um, beyond the skin to things like lymph nodes and organs. So it's a little more aggressive than a basal cell. Um, but early diagnosis and treatment results in 92 to 97% cure rates with surgery. So where to watch? Head and neck, same things, sun exposed sites. Now ear and lips are higher risk for squamous cell. Those, if you develop a squamous cell on your ear or your lip, those do have a higher um, chance of spread. So I always tell patients, let's really make sure we're examining those areas. Um, and the lower legs, hands and arms are also at risk. And squamous cell carcinomas can look like a red scaly flat patch. It can look like a scaly bump. It can look like a crusty nodule. It can look like a rapidly growing nodule and it can often be tender. And um, these patients, you know, I always tell patients also look for that sign of bleeding and crusting, something, a non-healing wound. Some patients will say, you know, I thought I was shaving and I cut myself and it never quite healed. And that's a sign of a basal or a squamous cell cancer because those cells just aren't healthy enough to heal. Now there's 
um, excellent outcomes of squamous cell carcinoma with really low recurrence rates, really low rates of uh, metastasis. But there is a subset of very aggressive tumors with higher metastatic rates of 20%. And this leads to about 15,000 annual deaths, which is almost twice as many deaths that you see with melanoma. But squamous cell carcinoma is far more common. And that's, you know, so we, we don't hear about it as being as serious as melanomas, but if you do develop an aggressive squamous cell carcinoma, it can be concerning. Um, and actinic keratoses are sort of the precursor, precancerous lesion to the squamous cell carcinoma. And these start in that top layer of skin called the epidermis, related to sun exposure as well. And about five to 10% of actinic keratoses can progress to squamous cell carcinomas. And these are treated well with either cryotherapy, which is freezing it with um, cold spray with liquid nitrogen or various topical therapies, which I'll get into later. So we wanna watch those sun exposed sites again. And we're looking for sort of rough scaly red lesions. And sometimes your dermatologist will kind of use their fingers to feel the skin. Cause sometimes we can feel these before we can really see these. Now, melanoma is the most deadly form of skin cancer. It it's, um, attributes 75% of skin cancer deaths. It originates in pigment producing cells called melanocytes. Um, it's common in younger women, and we see it a lot in women between 15 and 30, as well as older men, usually over the age of 65. The majority are due to ultraviolet radiation. There is a subset that um, is related to genetic factors. And one third arise in previously existing moles and two thirds are arising just on normal skin, you know, de novo. So where to watch? With melanoma, it's really anywhere on the body. It does not have to be sun exposed. Um, with men, the highest um, areas of incidence are chest, abdomen, and back. In women, it's lower legs. And in older patients, we see this frequently on the face. And so what are we looking for? You know, the ABCDs of melanoma are really important to sort of understand. And when you're examining, doing your self-skin checks, these, this can be really helpful. So what we're looking for is A, asymmetry. So if you split the mole in half, one side looks different than the other half. B is border. I want nice, smooth, round borders. I don't like to see irregular borders. C is for color. If there's multiple colors, maybe black, red, blue, purple, that's concerning to me. Um, if the diameter is greater than six millimeters, which is about the diameter of a pencil eraser, although I joke who's using pencils anymore, everyone's always like on their phone. So we, I don't know if that's a good, good marker anymore, but diameter greater than six millimeters and then evolving anything that's changing, you know, you want to have your dermatologist evaluate. And then there's other rare tumors, which we're not going to get too much into. Um, we treat these with most surgery and we work with our surgical oncologists, radiation oncologists and medical oncologists um, to treat some of these cancers as well. And our units um, participating in a multi-institutional research endeavor to kind of identify best practices to diagnose stage and treat these very rare cancers. So early detection, this is crucial for curing cancer. Um, the direct correlation between melanoma thickness and survival rates is, is correlated between thickness and survival. So the five-year survival rate for local melanoma suggests in the skin is 98% to 99%. If it spreads to the lymph nodes, that survival rate goes to 62%. And if that spreads beyond the lymph nodes, that goes down to 15%. So we wanna catch these early when it's just in the skin so we can give you that high cure rate and that high five-year survival rate. So if you notice suspicious, suspicious change on your skin, it's important to see your dermatologist for skin cancer screening. Your dermatologist will, will perform a skin check and examine these concerning lesions and examine all of the skin. Any suspicious lesion will, get, will need to be biopsy to get a diagnosis. And you can also do monthly self skin checks in between your skin cancer screenings to help you detect skin cancer early. Um, and especially if you're a patient who has a lot of moles, it's good to know the pattern of your moles and your spots and your freckles. And family members can help you examine your scalp and your back. So when do we start screening? Everybody loves to ask this question and it's a tricky question because there's no specific guidelines. Um, you know, for colon cancer and breast cancer, we're used to hearing that, you know, when you're 40, get your mammogram, when you're 45 now, get your colonoscopy. And with skin cancer screening, there's just no great data. And what we really base this on is risk factors. If you have a family history of melanoma, if you have a lot of funny looking moles, if you have a history of five sunburns or more, if you have a really fair skin type, um, or a prior history of skin cancer, you want to be get a baseline uh, skin exam. If you don't have any of these risk factors, then you can work with your primary care doctor usually to help you determine when you need to start that screening. But if you have these risk factors, then you should get a baseline skin cancer screening. 
So the skin cancer screening is a window of opportunity to prevent actinic keratosis from becoming cancer. We can start treating those early. We can examine other risk factors such as your skin type and atypical moles. We can counsel on sun protection and counsel on the frequency of skin checks. Once you have your baseline skin cancer screening, your dermatologist can guide you and they might say, hey, you know what, you're looking really good. I'm gonna see you back in two to three years. Or they might say, you know what, you've got a lot of atypical moles. I wanna watch these closely. I'm gonna see you back in six months. So it's very tailored by the dermatologist. And um, if you have a history of prior skin cancer, it'll be more frequent. Usually if you have a basal cell or squamous cell cancer, the follow-up is every six to 12 months. If you have a history of an aggressive squamous cell cancer, that might be every three months. Um, for melanoma, for invasive melanomas, the follow-up is every three months for a skin, full skin check. And if it's melanoma in situ, which is just limited to that surface of the skin, it's every three to six months. So what is a full skin check? Um, you know, oftentimes I walk in a room and the patient's like, wait, I need to wear a gown for my full skin check. And I say, yeah, we're going to look at everything from your head to your toe. And this includes looking at your nails. So you want to go to your doctor with, you know, no nail polish on, ideally no makeup on because they're just going to want to take that makeup off so we can get a really good look at your skin. Um, if you can wear your hair loose or down if possible, that makes it easier to examine the scalp and, you know, there's places that people don't think they can get skin cancer, like your scalp or your lips or your hands and your feet and your groin. And these are all areas where you can develop skin cancer. So we really want to look at all of the skin and your dermatologist might use a dermatoscope, which is um, a device that helps magnify um, the features of the skin cancer. And um, patients always ask me, you know, can we do a blood test to see if we're at risk for skin cancer? If we have skin cancer, can we do a CAT scan? And the answer is no, really the, the way that we detect skin cancer is by visual examination by your dermatologist. And so the skin biopsy is then the way we make the diagnosis if you have a suspicious lesion. And this is an in-office procedure. We numb the area with lidocaine, and then we usually do a shave biopsy. And that's literally just shaving that lesion off, putting it in a specimen bottle, and it goes to the lab for, for histologic processing and diagnosis. And we usually get a result in a few days. After the biopsy, we usually apply Vaseline and a Band-Aid, and there's no real major activity restrictions after a biopsy. It's a very sort of um, minimally invasive procedure. It's important to know that cancers are not removed with a biopsy. You'll still need further treatment. Patients um, will often ask me, you know, they've read about these tape strip biopsies that, you know, are floating around the internet. And that only removes really the surface stratum corneum. It can be an aid to biopsy some other skin conditions, but it's really not something that we can use to diagnose skin cancers. And there's a lot of mole detection apps that are out there now where it says, you know, hold your iPhone on your moles and we'll tell you if this is a melanoma. Um, but the studies have shown that these can miss melanomas. You get different results when you shine the app on the exact same spot. It can't detect amelanotic melanomas, which are melanomas that don't have pigment, and it can't detect non-melanoma skin cancers like basal or squamous cell. And it really relies on the patient to decide which, which spot is suspicious. And I will say the number of times we get, you know, this picture from a patient saying, I'm really worried that this is a melanoma. And we look at that and two seconds later, we say, you know what, we've seen this through years of training. This is a seborrheic keratosis. But I'm concerned about this spot, which might not look like much to, much to you, but that actually was an amelanotic melanoma. So I think that we need to you know, be wary, bit wary of these um, technological devices as being the sole way to, to, to examine your skin. So self-skin checks are really important in between seeing your dermatologist. And um, there, the AAD website has some great tips about how to do a full skin check. You know, you want to examine your whole body, front and back in the mirror, raise your arms, look under your armpits, on your flanks, bend your elbows. So you're looking at your forearms, underarms, palms, look at the backs of the legs, look at the spaces between your toes, the soles of the feet. Um, and you can use a mirror to help look at your scalp. And again, sometimes you can get a family member to help you look at your scalp. And you want to check your back and buttocks with a hand mirror as well. So half of melanomas are self-detected, which I think is, is just shows how important self-skin checks are and how important it is to know your skin. So we're going to move on to treatment. And the way we decide how to treat a particular cancer is based on the type of tumor it is and sort of the histologic features. You can have really kind of low, you know, non-aggressive basal cells and you can have pretty aggressive basal cells. So they're gonna be treated two different ways, the size of the skin cancer and the location. Now, most skin cancers on the head and neck are considered high risk skin cancers, whereas the trunk and extremity are considered lower risk. But if we see a larger cancer on the trunk or extremity, or if we see something that has um, funny features under the microscope, we might say, okay, this is a little more high risk. So low risk tumors for basal cell and squamous cell carcinoma can be treated with destruction 
um, where we can kind of scrape and burn the, the cancer, and I'll get more into that in the next slide, or surgical excision. Um, there's some studies show that topical chemotherapy can be used in very superficial tumors. Um, the highest cure rates are definitely with the destruction of the surgical excision, and the uh, cure rates with chemotherapy go down to like 75 to 80 percent versus having that 90 to 95 percent cure rate. Um, High-risk tumors are really best treated with Mohs micrographic surgery, which gives us a 99% cure rate for basal cell carcinoma and 92 to 97% for squamous cell carcinoma. For high-risk tumors, sometimes we'll send patients for post-op radiation. And for very advanced tumors, we also usually work with our medical oncologists for systemic and targeted therapies. Um, patients will ask me a lot about the role of superficial radiation treatment for low-risk tumors. And I think that um, there's a role for it in some in patients who you know, can't really undergo a surgical procedure. The studies actually show that the cosmetic outcomes with surgery are actually better than radiation, because I know some people are worried about scar appearance, but radiation can also give you, um, you know, surface changes to the skin that can, not, that can be cosmetically displeasing. Um, and also patients who are younger, we want to avoid radiation because you can develop new skin cancers or other cancers when you're exposed to radiation. And we did a study here at UT Southwestern in our unit that showed that high-risk squamous cell carcinomas that are treated with Mohs alone provided a superior cure rate. So in terms of the treatment of melanoma, um, thin melanoma, stage zero, which is melanoma in situ and stage 1A melanoma, um, these are thinner melanomas and do, these are treated very well with just a wide local excision. Um, we do do most surgery for very thin melanomas on the head and neck so we can be tissue sparing. Um, but for advanced stage tumors, these usually require a multidisciplinary approach with surgery, lymph node evaluation, imaging and systemic chemotherapy. So going back to sort of these destructive methods I mentioned, um, we can destroy the cancer cells in a normal margin of tissue with electrocautery. This gives us excellent cure rates for basal and squamous cell carcinoma in situ, so that's surface um, skin cancer. This is all an in-office procedure performed with local anesthesia. There's minimal restrictions on your activities. I do the procedure and tell patients you can go back to your usual activities in a couple of days. There's no stitches and you heal with a circular scar. And here's just a depiction of um, the procedure where we're using that curette to scrape away the cancer cells, and then we're using electrosurgery to kind of destroy the cancer and to destroy a margin of normal tissue around it. And then you um, leave with this sort of shallow open wound that will heal in the next month. And patients usually heal very well this way. And, you know, my, a lot of my patients are very active and they don't want to take a week or two after surgery. And if we can treat a low-risk skin, skin cancer and give you an excellent cure rate, then this is a good option. The other option is to remove the cancer with surgery where we, you know, cut um, a portion of the cancer and a margin of normal tissue around it. And, you know, whenever we cut a circle into, and we stitch into a straight line, it kind of puckers on either end. So that's why I have this sort of football shaped area designed here. Um, so we always have to sort of elongate that closure in order to get the skin to lay nice and flat and to give you the best scar in the long run. Patients always say, I came in with this tiny spot and now I have this long line scar. But that's sort of why we have to remove that margin, but then also remove that extra bit of tissue to make that scar lay flat and fade into the background. With the surgical excision, we do send the tissue to the lab to confirm a clear margin. And this gives us an excellent cure rate for low-risk basal and squamous cell carcinomas. And here's just a depiction of um, you know, the incision and then the removal of the skin cancer and then the sutured line. So Mohs micrographic surgery, this is what I spend most of my time doing. This is an advanced, precise, and effective treatment for most skin cancers, and it's mainly used for head and neck skin cancers. It's a tissue sparing surgery, which removes the entire tumor while leaving the surrounding healthy tissue intact. It carefully maps out the roots of a skin cancer using a microscope, and it provides the highest cure rate for most skin cancers. It's an in-office procedure. It's performed under local anesthesia by fellowship-trained Mohs surgeons with expertise in dermatology, skin cancer, Mohs surgery, and reconstructive surgery. So step one is where we mark the spot with a marker, we identify the cancer, and we numb it with local anesthetic. We then take a margin of about two millimeters around that skin cancer, hoping that we get it in that two millimeters, and then we send that to the lab. At that point, we put a pressure dressing on and we have the patient wait in our waiting room while we process the tissue. And the tissue processing involves freezing the tissue, staining the tissue, cutting the tissue and staining it. So it takes a little bit of time. And the tissue is mapped precisely on a diagram. We ink the tissue so we know exactly where we have to go back if we see residual cancer. 
And so I kind of make a map at 12 o'clock, three o'clock, six o'clock and nine o'clock. And if I saw cancer left between three, 12 and three, I'm only gonna go back to that area. So we can leave the rest of the healthy tissue intact. We don't have to go around the whole thing again. So this way we can really spare that healthy tissue. And with Mohs, we look at 100% of the margin um, for residual cancer. If we see cancer left behind, we'll go back and remove more and then process that in the lab. And we'll kind of repeat this until the defect is clear. The majority of tumors are cleared in one to two stages. For advanced um, cancer, sometimes it can track out more. And this is just a depiction to show the difference between Mohs versus sort of that wide local excision. So with Mohs, we remove the tissue, we press 100% of the margin down on a slide. So even if there's just a small tumor root or aggregate, we can catch that with Mohs. Now with a wide local excision, that tissue on the right-hand side of the screen, we send that to the lab and they slice it up like a loaf of bread. And they just look at a few slices and that's representative of the whole margin. But in reality, that's only looking at about 0.1% of the margin. And so you can theoretically miss some roots. So for the head and neck, where we really wanna spare that tissue and use the tiniest margins possible, we really need to use Mo's margin control. We're looking at 100% of the margin to give you the best curates. So what can be treated with Mohs? This is going to be head and neck tumors, most basals and squamous cells, um, some thin early melanomas. We treat using MART1 immunostains, which is just another special stain we use in the lab, as well as rare tumors. And this is just an example of the MART1 immunostain. Um, the top pink and purple slide just shows sort of the normal skin or, or the sort of normal stain we use for most of our basals and squamous cell carcinomas. And it can be pretty tricky to detect melanoma, but when we use our special stain, it really lights up those melanoma cells and really gives us an accurate curate. And um, UT Southwestern has really been a pioneer in treating Mohs for melanoma. And um, just to show you sort of the process of Mohs, you know, this is removing the skin cancer with that very small margin, inking the tissue, looking at the slides under the microscope and going back to that precise area to remove more. And because the surgeon is also the pathologist, it really just makes our precision for isolating that tumor root really excellent. And then once the tumor is clear, we get to the healing portion. Um, so one option for some areas is natural healing. Um, for really shallow skin cancers on certain portions of the ear or the lip or you know, the inner eyelid, sometimes these can heal beautifully without doing stitches. Sometimes we need to close the wound side to side with stitches. And the goal is to hide that closure along, along a natural wrinkle line or crease. Um, sometimes we have to borrow skin from somewhere else on the body as a skin graft and, co and cover the defect. And sometimes we have to do a skin flap. And this is where we sort of loosen skin nearby where it's a little bit looser. Sometimes we have a little looser skin lower on our cheek and we shift it up into place um, to cover it where it's a little bit tighter. And in this case, this is an example of a skin flap where skin was sort of shifted from the loose part of um, the middle of the nose and kind of shift it over. Now I'm going to show you some pictures of patients of mine where, you know, after we remove the cancer it can be extremely stressful and scary to see these defects on your face and think, oh my gosh, how am I going to look um, down the road? And even with the stitches, you know, pulled together, sometimes you can have swelling and bruising in the first week after surgery, and that can be pretty stressful and scary. But these patients had excellent outcomes in the long run um, with just barely visible scars. Here's another patient of mine who had a skin cancer on the nose. You know, on the first picture on the left, you know, just a minimal bump was there, but these roots where these skin cancers can get pretty deep. Um, he had a skin flap and it's just healed beautifully. And here's just another example with even a deeper cancer kind of on that nose cheek junction um, where we removed the cancer with Mohs, got an excellent curate, was able to repair the defect under local anesthesia at the same you know, office visit. And this is the patient at the bottom of the screen one week out only and already really looking excellent. And sometimes we get more extensive um, skin cancers on the ear and you can see, you know, we're able to kind of recreate that whole side of the ear with our um, surgery under local anesthetic very safely and giving an excellent cosmetic result. And this is an example of a skin graft where we kind of sew that circular patch borrowed from somewhere else onto the skin. So how do we prepare for surgery? You can eat and take your medications, including blood thinners. You wanna avoid alcohol for two days prior to and after surgery. You wanna get a good night's rest before surgery. Usually recommend wearing loose, comfortable clothing. Um, and you wanna bring a sweater because it's usually cold in the clinics. And be prepared to spend the day with us. I say, bring a book, bring your you know, iPad, there's Wi-Fi available, bring a family member with you, um, bring a snack or lunch with you, you can eat during surgery. And I usually recommend having a driver take you home. Sometimes if you have bandaging on the center of the face and it's been a long day, it's nice to have someone to take you home. 
Um, most patients will experience bruising and swelling and mild discomfort after surgery. Ice packs, elevation, Tylenol, and ibuprofen are really helpful. Usually stitches come out in one to two weeks. Rest is super important for healing. You want to avoid exercise and heavy lifting for one to two weeks after surgery. And I always say, let your surgeon know if you have upcoming travel plans or major, major social events. The number of times we've already started surgery and I hear, oh, my son's getting married next week. I think, oh my gosh, you're going to have like a black eye. Um, we want to try to you know, plan for the best timing. Um, on the day of surgery, you're going to receive written instructions on how to take care of your wound. And you want to be, we are available for urgent concerns overnight and weekends. So we never want patients to be worried. You know, what if something happens, you can always reach us. Um, treatment considerations, talk to your dermatologist about the timing of the procedure, recovery expectations, activity restrictions, and scar management. So some patients will say, you know, I'm too old to worry about the slow, slow growing cancer doc. You know, I'm 80, but you know what? Patients are living long now. I have a lot of patients. I have a 95 year old patients who probably run, you know, longer distances than I can. And they're very functional and very active. And if you let these skin cancers fester, they will become non-healing infected wounds. They can destroy critical structures, give you nerve damage, um, destroy eyelids. You know, we've seen ears, noses. We've seen these things destroyed by skin cancer where we could have really done a much simple in-office procedure. Now we have to deal with a much bigger surgery. Um, and we were involved in a multi-institution study across the country that showed that the most important status in development and determining the best treatment for patients is looking at their functional status. You know, age, you know, age is a number, right? So I have patients, like I said, who are very old, who do great with surgery. And I have patients who are younger, who have more medical problems and maybe a simpler treatment is better. So in terms of follow-up, you'll need regular follow-up with your dermatologist to check for recurrence and to check for new cancers. So let's quickly move to prevention. So preventive methods, we wanna use sunscreen. Um, regular sunscreen use reduces your risk of melanoma by 50% and squamous cell carcinoma by 40%. You wanna seek shade, especially during 10 a.m. to 4 p.m., which the strongest um, sun's rays are. And really in Texas, I think it's like 10 to six. The sun is still extremely intense at 6 p.m. here. Um, and you can get reflection from water, sand, and glass. You wanna be aware of those areas. Um, you want to wear sun protective clothing, and this is closed with UPF. And the UPF number tells us what fraction of the sun's rays penetrate the fabric. So if you're UPF 50, that means 1 50th of the sun's rays will reach your skin. Um, sunglasses are also very important to protect the skin, but as well as to protect the eyes from cataracts. And you want to avoid tanning salons. So how does sunscreen work? We have physical blockers like zinc oxide and titanium dioxide, and we have chemical blockers like the ones that have the chemical sounding names. Common ones are oxybenzone, um, octosalate, octocrylene. Um, the physical blockers are great for sensitive skin. What they do is they deflect or shield the ultraviolet radiation, um, whereas chemical blockers absorb the ultraviolet radiation and kind of release it at a lower energy as, as, as heat. Um, the chemical blockers, the nice thing about those is they're more elegant. They have kind of, you can make a thinner product out of it. So there's a little bit of a less of a residue. Um, sunscreens come in a variety of formulations. Creams are usually best for dry skin and the face. Gels are good for hairy areas like the chest or the scalp. Sticks can be nice around the eyes because they're not as, they don't quite get as melty or drippy into the eyes. Um, sprays, you know, they're really easy to put on, especially for, you know, those kids. I have a three, five and seven year old and they're always like wriggling around. Um, but the sprays really just don't apply as evenly as the other options do. Um, patients always ask me about what about the sunscreen when my makeup? That's usually SPF 15, which is not a really strong SPF. And also, you know, we usually aren't reapplying our makeup every two hours, which is really the recommendation for sunscreen. Um, and the FDA recently said that the sunscreen bug repellent combinations are not safe because um, you, you would need to reapply the sunscreen part every two hours, but then you're getting too much bug repellent exposure. So it's best to really use those separately. And I would say the best sunscreen is the one that you'll use. There's a variety depicted on the screen here. Um, and I really think that all of these are excellent. It's the one that you feel is comfortable on your skin. So let's decode the sunscreen bottle. The things that are important for the dermatologist are that this is a broad spectrum uh, sunscreen. That means it covers for UVB and UVA rays. We want it to be SPF 30 or higher, and we want it to be water resistant for um, 40 or 80 minutes. And that means that if you go in the water with your sunscreen and your, SP and your um, sunscreen is water resistant for 80 minutes, after 80 minutes, you need to reapply. It hasn't been two hours yet, but you still need to reapply. If it's only water resistant for 40 minutes, you need to reapply at that point. And we need one ounce of sunscreen, enough to fill a shot glass to really cover the exposed areas of your body. That's quite a bit of sunscreen. 
So what is SPF? So sun protection factor. The way that this was determined was looking at what's called the minimal erythema dose on sunscreen treated skin versus the minimal erythema dose on untreated skin. And basically it tells us how long the sun's UVB rays would take to redden your skin with sunscreen relative to without sunscreen. For, for, so for SPF 30, it takes 30 times longer to redden your skin with the sunscreen than without it. And SPF 15, I mentioned, blocks about 90% of the sun's rays. SPF 30 blocks about 97%, and SPF 50 blocks about 98.5%. So patients will ask, well, what's the difference between 30 and 50? It sounds like it's just 1.5% more, but if you think about it, it actually protects you, know, protects you double the amount because that 3% divided by two, that you're getting double the protection. So some tips, you wanna use your sunscreen every day. You wanna generously coat all exposed surfaces with a shot glass ounce. You wanna apply it 15 minutes before going outside. Make sure you're using lip balm for the lips. Reapply every two hours. Um, the FDA requires sunscreens to be stable for three years. Patients always ask, hey, I've got this bottle from like two years ago, is it okay to use? And I say, well, you weren't using it right because you needed, it would have been, gotten finished, but it should be stable for three years and you can use, um, you know, the expiration date on the bottle, you can write the date on the bottle from when you opened it and look for changes in color or consistency. If it looks like it's a little runny or it looks like the colors change, then just get a new sunscreen. And you wanna avoid sunscreen in babies less than six months and they should re really be um, in the shade, really practicing strict sun avoidance because they have, you know, lots of um, exposed skin and they're at risk for dehydration and sunburn. So unexpected situations, driving in the car. Um, a lot of my patients, I recommend wearing like a sleeve if they're you know, spending 45 minutes to an hour, which is common to commute in DFW. Um, so you can either put sunscreen on your arms or you can get those driving sleeves and driving gloves. Um, sitting in an airplane midday, you're getting a lot of exposure. We see a lot of pilots with skin cancer. Cloudy days, even though it feels nicer outside, 80% of the sun rays are passing through. So you wanna make sure you've got your sunscreen on. Um, UV nail dryers after manicures and pedicures can be an exposure risk. Um, and then the beach, you know, the sand reflects 25% of UV rays. And even when you're skiing, you know, if you're wearing your goggles, you know, you get that nice tan if you're skiing. So um, the snow really reflects about 80% of those rays. So you want to make sure you're wearing sunscreen in those situations as well. So patients always ask, you know, is sunscreen safe? We're always hearing about the FDA studying these. So there are claims that, you know, sunscreens, the claims that sunscreens are not safe are not proven. Um, the FDA initiated new studies on sunscreen and showed that there is systemic absorption of some ingredients. So they're investigating these more, but it's important to remember that just because something's absorbed doesn't mean that it's bad. We take so many, you know, things in our body that we want absorbed. So it doesn't necessarily mean it's bad. Um, the FDA said that zinc oxide and titanium dioxide are, are generally, that's considered grace. It's um, generally safe and effective. Um, for the other sunscreen ingredients, they're continuing ongoing studies, but the FDA recommends that we still continue to use the sunscreens. Um, you know, there's been some stuff in the news about coral reefs and endocrine effects of sunscreens. And most of the studies kind of show mixed data. So I think that the, you know, for the risk is, still being studied. Um, for coral reefs, it's been shown that zinc oxide and titanium dioxide are not a risk. So in Hawaii, they banned the chemical blockers. We recommend using the physical blockers there. Um, patients ask me all the time about vitamin D. Is the sunscreen going to prevent my vitamin D, you know, lower my vitamin D level? But studies have shown that regular sunscreen use doesn't decrease vitamin D levels. Um, and even if you go outside without sunscreen on, it does not increase your vitamin D level to the point that you don't need to oral supplements. You still need to orally supplement with either a diet or supplementation. Um, vitamin D is critical for healthy bones, but there's been no evidence showing that it has activity against cancer or that improves cancer survival. Um, there's a couple of things that we can take orally that can help prevent skin cancer. One of these is um, polypodium leucotomus, which is um, marketed as HelioCare. This is a fern in Central and South America. It's an antioxidant. It blocks reactive oxygen species and free radicals. And these are high energy compounds that cause cellular damage. And the supplements have been used in Europe for 40 years with no concerning side effects. And um, you can get a two month supply online for about 30 bucks. And there's no studies that really show that it reduces skin cancer, but it does prevent um, sun, sunburn. And um, the thought is that it will reduce UV damage. Um, nicotinamide is another you know, um, vitamin B3 agent that you can find online. You take five mil 500 milligrams twice daily, and that has been shown to reduce actinic keratosis by 13% and non-melanoma skin cancers by 23%. And this actually enhances the DNA repair. Um, so you get the UV damage, 
to your DNA and this helps repair it. You do want to be cautious if some of your medications also affect your liver. So you do want to talk to your doctor about, about taking this. Um, for patients who have a lot of actinic keratoses or those precancers, if you have a few, your doctor will treat these with liquid nitrogen. If you have a lot of these, these can be treated with something called field therapy, which is a topical chemotherapy you can do at home. The ones we commonly really like to use are 5-4-Uracil or Imiquimod. And there's also an in-clinic procedure called photodynamic therapy, where we paint a medication on your face, and then we shine a blue light on it, and that stimulates um, the precancerous cells to be destroyed. Um, usually you'll have some redness, crusting, oozing, and blistering. And I tell patients, the better the reaction, that's getting a lot rid of a lot of precancers. So we want to see a strong reaction. That means it's work, working well. You do need to strictly avoid sun exposure during your treatment. And this is just an example of a patient who's got all that red scaly damage. And this is what they look like during treatment. So you get that redness, crusting, oozing. And then here's a patient um, pre-treatment with all that red and scaliness. And you can see on the right-hand side of the screen that that skin is nice and smooth and those spots are just gone. So in summary, skin cancer is the most common but highly preventable and treatable skin cancer. Early detection allows for excellent outcomes and high survival rates. You wanna avoid tanning beds, um, use your sunscreen and sun protective clothing and behaviors and keep up with your full skin checks with your dermatologist. We have an amazing team um, to help treat skin cancer at UT Southwestern. And you know, our goal is to really provide compassionate and comprehensive skin cancer care. And here's some more skin cancer resources. And I'll just leave this screen up um, if you wanna jot some of those down or take a photo of those resources. And um, I'm happy to take questions. Dr. Shravastava, thank you so much for your presentation. We will now get into our questions and answers portion of this session. And we'll begin with uh, some of the questions that were submitted ahead of time, and then we'll address some questions that have been posted in the chat. Um, so one of the questions that, were, that was asked ahead of time, does having basal cell carcinoma at a young age predispose an individual to susquamous cell carcinoma or melanomas at they, as they age? And that's such a great question. And I will say, you know, when I started practicing, I've been in practice for about 12 years. You know, most of my patients were in their, you know, 50s, 60s, and 70s. And I'm seeing a lot of women in their 20s and 30s and 40s now with basal cell carcinoma. And so we're sort of seeing a shift in demographics. And part of this is from, um, you know, tanning behavior. And, you know, in Texas, the sun is just so intense here, but we're definitely seeing a lot of younger patients with basal cell carcinoma. And I do counsel my patients, you know, at this young age, you know, this tells me that you have, you know, probably fair skin, light eyes, you have a history of ultraviolet radiation exposure, and you've kind of hit that threshold of enough ultraviolet, you know, that cumulative dose where you're forming these skin cancers now. So this puts you at risk, not just for basal cell skin cancers, but also for squamous cell carcinoma and melanoma. So at that point, it is important to do um, your self skin checks, you know, once a month and also see your dermatologist for routine um, skin cancer screenings. Thank you. We have a question in the chat and it's from Debbie. What sunscreens are available for under eyes? So under eyes can be a tricky area. Um, and I, most of the facial sunscreens, I really like Elta MD. You can apply those under the eyes. Usually physical blockers are gonna be less irritating. And if you get the sunscreen sticks, it can be um, easier to apply. You can kind of pull the skin down and apply it in that area. But really the, you know, you're gonna couple that with wearing sunglasses and that's gonna really be super protective because that's the skin can be more sensitive, but I think physical blockers can be um, less, you know, irritating to that eye area, but sunglasses are gonna be super important. Our next question is from Marla. And she wants to ask, does car window tint block UV rays? So um, naturally the, the um, windshields come with a UV blockage. UVB typically doesn't pass, you know, doesn't pass through windows as much, but UVA does. So there are window tints that you can get, um, but they're not actually allowed in a lot of different areas. So I'm not sure exactly what the regulations are um, right now. In Texas, but a lot of times you can't have tint on your windows um, due to legalities, etc. So um, you have to kind of get special permission to get tinted windows. Thank you. Our next question is from Shelly, and she wants to know the best way to find a, der a dermatologist that specializes in skin health and can provide surgery if necessary versus a cosmetic procedure. 
Mm -hmm. That's a great question. Um, you know, there's a lot of dermatologists in Dallas who are really excellent. And I think we've got a fantastic team at UT Southwestern, a lot of um, dermatologists who are, you know, specializing in medical dermatology, skin cancer checks. Um, and we also have a clinic that, you know, is a cosmetic clinic, but a lot of patients will go there for just sort of general skin health tips for um, hydration. And, the, you know, the physicians also counsel on um, sun protection in those clinics and what you can do for aging skin. Um, but I think that, you know, we've got a great group at UT Southwestern. I think if you are looking for a dermatologist, you can go um, to the AED website and go to find a doctor and you can usually find, you know, excellent recommendations from um, the websites listed here as well. Our next question is from Debbie. If you're not sitting in the sun while inside your house, are you still being affected by UV rays? Um, so if you're sitting button, you know, next to your window, you are going to be affected by UV rays. Um, a lot of, there's been a lot more buzz about like the blue light that you can get from like your TV screens and your devices. And those have been shown to darken um, darker skin tones, but not really have as much effect on lighter skin tones. Um, but if you're by a window, um, you know, you need to think about sun protection. Thank you. So our next question is from Lynn. Do you have any recommendations on selecting the right sunglasses to protect your eyes? Um, so most sunglasses will say like UVA, UVB, um, like 100% solar protection. And so I'm not super up to date on, you know, whether there's any other indications on that, um, but we can look into it and, and get an answer for you. Thank you. Our next question is from Michelle. Is there a correlation, correlation between HPV and skin cancer from recent studies? Yes, um, that's definitely one of the risk factors for skin cancer. And typically we see it, these skin cancers uh, more commonly in the genital region and um, male skin cancers are commonly caused by HPV. Um, so the kind of on the digits and the nails in the genital region. And um, these cancers can still be treated in a very similar manner with surgery. And for patients who have genital related, uh, HPV related genital cancers, I also recommend seeing um, your OBGYN, your urologist regularly for your full skin checks and also for, you know, an internal exam. Okay. And there's some topical treatments also, if you have a history of HPV, if you have a history of warts and develop a skin cancer, there's also some topicals that we mentioned with actinic keratosis that imiquimod that can also kind of field treat the area. And there's been some studies that are looking at, you know, the HPV vaccine and, you know, can we use that to reduce the incidence of skin cancer, especially in patients who are at really high risk for skin cancers, like transplant patients. And so there's been some very, very preliminary case reports and studies showing that, you know, maybe the HPV vaccine will play a role in helping to prevent these skin cancers too. Next question is from Barbara. And she would like for you to talk about foods that may help prevent um, skin cancer. That's a great question. Um, so there hasn't really been any, you know, scientific data really showing that there's specific food that helps. You know, some some patients will ask, "Well, I read that omega, you know, omega uh, fatty acids will help." improve my skin. And so there's really no data showing that, that fish or green vegetables or nuts um, really prevent skin cancer. And so I think the two vitamins that I had mentioned, the vitamin B3, the nicotinamide and the polyploidium leucotomus are sort of the two agents that I would consider orally. So, I, but I don't think there's been any shown any food that really is gonna help prevent skin cancer or protect against ultraviolet radiation. Our next question is from Stuart, and he would like to know, is there a correlation between skin cancer and rosacea? So no, there's not really a correlation between skin cancer and rosacea. Um, but one tricky thing is that rosacea usually affects, you know, the central face where we commonly see basal cell skin cancers. And rosacea um, lesions are, you know, kind of pimple-like bumps, and you can get little tiny broken blood vessels in the area. And basal cell carcinomas also look like a shiny bump with little 
you know, telangiectasias or little broken blood vessels on the surface. And so that's why it's so important to have your dermatologist really screen that area for you because it can be tricky to tell the subtle differences between the rosacea and early basal cell skin cancers. So no real correlation between the two, but it can just um, make your skin cancer screening just really, you know, we gotta be really meticulous about it. Thank you. Ms. Kathy wants to know, are diabetics more prone to skin cancer? You know, there hasn't really been any study showing that diabetics are more, more prone to skin cancer. Um, it's definitely a consideration we take into account when we're doing surgery for patients because it does affect wound healing. Um, so usually, you know, we want to make sure patients have their diabetes well controlled for optimal wound healing, um, especially if you're having surgery like on your legs. Um, it can be like a little bit more of a delayed wound healing course. So we always really counsel our patients with diabetes, make sure that we're in a situation where we're operating where you're well controlled and just counsel them that they might have prolonged healing. Next question is from Ms. Shalia. You mentioned that some of the raised moles may be crusty or may bleed. Do either, do, do the either, the flat or raised, raised cancerous moles itch or burn? Um, typically patients do not complain of itching or burning. Usually skin cancers are pretty asymptomatic in terms of how they feel. The main thing is sort of that crusting or bleeding, but patients will still say it doesn't hurt. It doesn't itch. It doesn't burn. It just, the crust is there and the little bleeding bits there usually doesn't feel painful. Um, there are some very advanced skin cancers where you can have pain. And usually those are not subtle on the skin. They're pretty obvious skin cancers where they're involving the nerves and that can lead to some numbness or pain. Next question is from Shelly and she wants to know, is it necessary to invest in sun resistance clothing, especially for out, outdoor activities like hiking and biking or is normal long sleeve shirts and pants? Okay. That's a great question. Um, I really strongly recommend doing the sun protective clothing with the UPF. Um, so there are some clothes that are going to protect you a little bit more, like a darker weave, um, a darker color, a thicker weave, like wool or denim, that's going to be a little bit more protective versus um, like a looser cotton that's going to be a little less protective. And so, but neither of them is, is very protective at all. So I really recommend getting the fabric that has the UPF. And there's a lot of great companies now that are making clothes. Um, there's a company called Coolabar. It's C-O-O-L-I-B-A-R.com. It originally started in Australia, but now they also have um, centers in the U.S. as well. And they, you know, initially they started out making kind of just, I felt like the sun protective clothing was really kind of dull and bland, but they're making like really nice options that, you know, you you're going to feel like, okay, this is a nice part of my wardrobe. I feel comfortable wearing this, you know, even when I'm traveling, if I'm going, you know, out to lunch, et cetera. Um, Columbia makes excellent clothes before they were just making, you know, the fishing shirts, but now they're making, um, you know, pants, dresses, tops, everything. Um, Patagonia as well. And Athleta also makes a lot of uh, sun protective clothing. So, you know, I personally recommend, you know, especially if you live in Texas, we spend a lot of time outdoors in the summer and in the winter time, it's a good idea to get some sun protective clothing. And when I, you know, when I hike with my kids and my family, I really, we all have, you know, broad rims, you know, broad rim sun hats on, we've got the, you know, sun jackets on, sun protective clothing and anything that's exposed sunscreen and reapplying it every two hours. Okay, our last question is from Scott and he wants to know how do skin tags come into play and what risks do they pose? And is there any risk with removing them yourself? So that's a great question. So skin tags um, are very, very common. I will say there have been some skin tags that looked like a skin tag, but there was something with, you know, the trained dermatologist eye where, you know, you've trained three years and beyond medical school, just really looking at tons of skin lesions. Sometimes they'll say, you know what, that one just looks a little off to me. And I want to send that to the lab for pathology. Sometimes we've seen tags and it'll shock us and say, oh, I thought it was a skin tag. Something made my radar go off to biopsy that and it'll be a melanoma. And so I do think it, I don't recommend um, just removing them yourself. I recommend getting a dermatologist to examine your skin and same thing with cosmetic procedures. You know, a lot of patients go to meta spas now to have things, you know, dark spots lasered off, et cetera. We've definitely seen patients 
who had melanomas that were lasered off. And then a year later, now they have this deep melanoma because it never was diagnosed initially and the pigment on the surface went away, but they had the lingering cells underneath. So I think it's super important if you're gonna pursue cosmetic procedures that you get a full skin check by your dermatologist to make sure that you don't have any skin cancers that need to be dealt with surgically, you know, to destroy them or do radiation, et cetera. We wanna treat the skin cancer before we do any cosmetic enhan enhancements. Thank you. That was our last question for the evening. Thank you so much, Dr. Shavastava. That Thank was such an, such an enlightening conversation. Thank you to Charlie, Jalen, and the public affairs team for helping facilitate tonight's event. This evening is our final Science Cafe before we take a break for the summer, but we will be back in August sharing more on your favorite science-related topics. On behalf of the Science Cafe team, as we close out this evening, we wish you all good health and wellness and a good night. And thanks again for joining us. We are adjourned. <laughs>